Uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Karen Rudd and Kevin Walters. Uh, Karen is the Manager of Cultural Affairs for the City of Norfolk, where she helped establish the public art program. She worked closely with city management, elected officials, a commission, and other city departments to pass the ordinance to develop policies and procurement process, contracts, and work plan, and she has commissioned the first projects. Additionally, Karen manages the Selden Arcade and opened the Selden Gallery, a community exhi exhibition space. Karen brings experience working with a variety of arts organizations, programming, creating opportunities for artists, and fundraising. She has coordinated over 400 large and small public art projects in three different government programs. Karen is a practicing painter who holds a BFA from the University of New Mexico. Prior to moving to Norfolk, Karen worked with the art program for the city of Albuquerque and the state of New Mexico. She was a project coordinator and associate manager of the public arts programs and also managed the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund Endowment. Kevin Walters uh, is the principal with Feng Shui, is it Feng Shui or Feng, Feng Shui? Feng Shui. Feng Shui. Okay. Feng Shui Planning. Mr. Walters is a graduate of the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Program at Virginia Commonwealth University, where his thesis focused on feng shui and neighborhood development. He has studied feng shui with the Western <laughs> School of Feng Shui and the Golden Gate <laughs> School of Feng Shui. He is the author of several articles of feng, on feng shui, including the Feng Shui of Seaside, published in the New Urbanism Division newsletter of the APA and the What Can We Learn from an Ancient Chinese Practice, published in the December 2007 edition of Planning Magazine. He has presented feng shui programs at two Virginia planning conferences, the National Healthy Homes Conference, the 2012 Virginia Main Street Toolkit Workshop, and the 2012 and 2013 Governor's Housing Conferences. Mr. Walters received a Bachelor of Business Administration from the College of William and Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Hi, y'all. <laughs> I have to be able to see it. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about feng shui on a broader scale and examine how the energy associated with public art can dramatically improve the success for a city environment. We have three primary goals. The first is to give you a lot of ideas based on the artists that we're showcasing. The second is to present examples of the process that can be used to bring the best art to your city or town. And the third is to help you look at public art from a completely new perspective, understanding that it is indeed alive in a very real energy, and the quality of that energy is what will sustain it. We want to expose you to a different perspective of feng shui, helping you to recognize some of the energies of uh, created by the form of the built environment and by the activities that take place there. I want to give you a sense of what I mean by the effect of the physical form. In the Rosemary Beach, Florida house, it can be conjectured that the residents are connected to the community. The glass doors give you a visual connection, but what's important here is the small wall. The small wall also tells you that there's a certain requirement for privacy. Very different energy if the wall is gone, they're completely exposed, or if they had chosen solid wood doors, the energy would be very different because they'd be completely um, isolated. Now this house in Seacrest, Florida, clearly the residents want to be left alone. The points from the roof that are pointed at anybody who would come up, put off what is called destructive chi or sha chi, and make you feel very discomforted. Um, now, whether this was the intention of the owners to discourage visitors really doesn't matter. This is the energy that's created by the form of this building. Feng Shui literally translated means wind and water. Wind being qi, the currents of life energy that flow all around us, and water is money. It's no coincidence that air and water are the two most critical necessities for survival. A place's feng shui is actually a nutrient that nourishes the people who visit there. Thousands of years ago in China, people recognized qi as the invisible vapor that surrounded all things. The movement of qi can be benevolent or destructive depending on its speed, and once understood, its flow can be modified to, to achieve specific results. Think about it this way. Everything is made of atoms. Atoms are moving particles. 
then that movement creates an energy field. So virtually everything is alive and everything is energy. When the energy created by the form of the environment, so when you're walking down a street and you make a turn and you feel really wonderful, um, what you're, what you're, um, what's happening is the effect of the physical form of the environment is what you're feeling. When you turn and you feel really creepy, it's the effect of the physical environment or the activity that's taking place. That's what you feel. The rule of thumb is wherever the eye goes is where the chi goes. So what this means is when you walk into a space, as, you, as your eye travels around the space, it gives you a really good idea of how the chi is flowing. So when you walk into a place like a museum and your eye goes from one beautiful object to the next, you really expect something more beautiful every, every time you turn the corner. Um, one very important thing is the, what happens with energy when you have um, glass doors at either end. Where the eye goes is where the chi goes. So what happens is when you open the door at the Monticello Arcade, your eye is, is drawn right to the light at the far end. So what happens is the energy rushes through the space and all of the galleries and the artists that are on the sides are kind of lost because the energy is bypassing them. This um, example from the UK, um, your eye is drawn to the windows at the top and they're not even real. So this is a really great example of how the chi is enhanced in this area. And once you see this, then you kind of lower, lower your eyesight and you see the um, wonderful shops. This is in the Brick Lane area of London. Um, how is the neighborhood defined by this wonderful egret? Um, what kind of energy is produced by this? Um, what is the impact on the community? How does it make you feel? And how different would it be if the egret is gone? Suddenly the, the energy shifts completely and, and the, um, what drew you to the area is suddenly gone. Now think about entering a space where there's something grossly inappropriate and unattractive. This graffiti creates the energy of abandonment, confusion, and sadness. Your eye tends to settle on it without moving on because you really don't want to see what might come next. This is stuck energy or stagnant chi. But what about this graffiti? What is the energy created by this? This is active, invigorating, more like impromptu murals, and this is an area that's frequented by skateboarders and bicyclists. It's a great example of the energy that's created and enhanced by the activity. And one of the, so feng shui is not wild about graffiti, but one of the important things with feng shui rules is how they apply. Because it's not necessarily just the one energy, it's the energy of everything interacting and, and coming together. So the context is really, really important. This is an elementary school in the UK. Obviously, there's some security-based issues here, but they've chosen to um, add color and art to make it very inviting for the kids. Without this, you would have the feeling of a factory or a prison, which is certainly not the energy that you want your kids to experience every day. What does this do for you? Let's take a closer look. <laughs> Anything that, that catches your attention is causing you to respond either positively or negatively. And it's, it's really in the eye of the beholder. So you, you have to determine, is this whimsical or is it creepy? So how are you going to feel seeing this every day? The energy of art is magnified when the art is observed because the observer participates lending his or her own energy to the experience. You want to hold their attention as long as you can. Every observation leaves an imprint, creating multiple opportunities and different vibrations. We buy art because of the way it makes us feel. We want to perpetuate that feeling every time we see it. Public art on a larger scale allows us to share that positive feeling and raise the energy for all who experience it. When we see something that makes us smile, our energy is boosted and that's what we want to do with public art. There's nothing new about public art. There's, um, it, you know, it would be since really the beginning of time, and many of you probably remember this from your art history class, this is where the art survey of art history started, the Caves of Lascaux, over 17,000 years ago. As humans were standing upright, they were changing the energy of their space. And it's pretty widely thought, widely thought that um, they were changing the energy of the hunt, that they were trying to predict a, su a successful hunt. Another picture. And they ha there's actually kind of an interesting mystery about this because there's no trace. It's dark back in the cave, and there's no trace of smoke anywhere. So they aren't sure how these were painted, what sort of light they must have used. Um, and then a little more modern day, the um, tombs in Egypt. This is um, one of the seven great wonders of the world that still exist, the only one. The, to, um, 
in the Valley of the Kings. And Egyptians must have believed not only were they changing the energy of their day by building these huge public art pieces, but that they also got to take their energy and their possessions with them into the afterworld. And then even more contemporary, um, artists have been working in city centers. So almost all the great cities of the world, artists have been working in Paris, at the um, Triumphant Arch, which is actually um, a war memorial to the soldiers, the French soldiers who died and fought in the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. So city centers are often where public art programs start and where we start doing public art. And then this piece, which um, I am, was really excited when I learned in Philadelphia, it's Alexander Calder's father who created this. So entrances are one of the most crit critical elements in feng shui. This is where the beneficial chi is invited to enter. The more beautiful and inviting the entrance, the more strong and supportive the energy is. Creating a magnificent entrance to a city or a home or a building or a space is the best way to bring positive energy to what you create. And then probably the most contemporary relative of public art programs today that we often call 1% programs was the WPA program. Really for the first time, city tax, taxpayer money was used to create artwork. And it really, the entire program was really designed not just to put Americans back to work and to put artists back to work, but to raise the spirits of a nation, to really change the energy of the way we thought about ourselves. This is um, the first documented um, WPA project in San Francisco, a mural by 26 artists. And although if you look at it, there really are some signs that America was in a depression. It was really designed to, to uplift. And the, the important point here is the intention. The intention of raising the spirits of the nation, and which is really the energy, raising the energy of the nation, is what's so important about this, a vehicle to make the nation feel better. So then in 1959, this was really the first 1% ordinance, a group of people, um, the Fairmont Park Association, and it was a group who really traditionally clean, were cleaning the bronzes in the parks in Philadelphia, a, a city full of rich art. And it was a response to um, modern architecture, that all this glass and steel and non-ornamented buildings, they said, well, can't you, at least if you're going to build these buildings, can't you give, set aside 1% so that we can put sculpture in front of the buildings? And you could, you'll maybe recognize some of these artists. That was, so um, I'm not, I don't think Philadelphia has a current 1% ordinance that's in effect now. But it was the, this was where it started. So when classical building ornamentation disappeared, the energy had to be created in a different way. It had to resurface as public art. So the buildings became utilitarian and mundane. The need for beauty and creativity had to be expressed in a different way. So then um, quickly followed the GSA program, which is um, our federal governments when they build federal courthouses. That's their 1% program. And lots of artists, in fact, we'll show you the one in front of the federal courthouse in Norfolk a little bit later. But these artists really helped make their careers on um, the GSA program. And then the NEA Art in Public Places, until it got so controversial, started that um, our National Endowment for the Arts was funding individual artists to put art out in the public. Um, and then public art kind of quickly spread. So it started in Philadelphia, and I, there, there were some Baltimore and some cities on the East Coast that joined in and, set, and convinced their city councils to put 1%. And it jumped over to the West Coast, so Seattle and Tacoma, and we'll show you some art from those cities. That, um, and the bigger cities in California, San Jose, st then started passing 1% programs. And then in the 70s and 80s, it kind of fl flew across the country. So, uh, you know, a couple examples of the bronzes that are in um, our public squares. Many cities have them. We're part of those early public art programs. Or uh, con more contemporary work. You maybe recognize um, that's in Norfolk. Uh, more contemporary piece that sits in the middle of a fountain. And I always say, so this is where really the term plop art was coined. That in the first part of my career was a kind of a negative that, ooh, plop art. But um, it because we were putting art in front of these buildings. And I don't know if you can read this cartoon, but it was always kind of, when I found it, I thought the New Yorker must have been reading my mind or something like that. It says this 6,847 pound of granite, it perfectly represents the squiggle that the architect left on the 
uh, for in front of the building. And I always, the first part of my career, I was trying to convince everybody that we needed a dot on the map, that we just, if they would just give us a dot, we would put art there and make sure it was, we spent their 1% and it was wonderful. And now I find that I'm really arguing for the map. <laughs> give me the map and we'll let the artists figure out where we get to put art. So in Norfolk in 2008, we, um, they started the, the commission and I was hired in 2006, but we passed our ordinance in 2008, so when we really got going. And what happened was they passed the ordinance and we had the map of Norfolk, and you're not intended to really read this, but they gave me these Excel spreadsheets of, okay, so here's $5,000 from this, and here's, here's a spreadsheet of money. And then we had to figure out, so where do we go from here? What do, what do we do? We've got a little money. They're letting us put art in Norfolk. How are we going to make these decisions? So the Public Art Commission, and it's uh, 11 members appointed by City Council. You all maybe have them. They, in Norfolk, they represent different um, fields. A landscape architect and an architect, um, and, an, and an architect always sit on there, a representative from the Planning Commission. So they come to us by their job duties. Um, said, we sat down and put a strategic plan together. How are we going to figure out, and if any of you were here yesterday, Richmond is just hired, uh, they have money from their prisons and four new schools, and they're kind of in this place like, okay, we've got money, and we've got a map, and now what do we do? So we decided in Norfolk that we would focus on really three key locations in Norfolk, and you know, you might have a hard time thinking of anything outside these but that our downtown was really the heart of Norfolk and if the heart had to be strong and that we were going to focus on putting projects downtown. We were also going to follow the capital program, which is the program that funds us, where 1% of all new capital in Norfolk is where we're funded. We were going to follow that program and build art in our community and neighborhoods. In fact, we really had a strategy that um, we were going to build eight or ten of these neighborhood feel-good pieces so that when we started to do something maybe a little more contemporary downtown, we could say, oh yeah, but look, we've built these things with our community that we know you'll love. We also knew um, we had a light rail in the plans. If any of you are, have embarked on any of that, you know it's uh, like raising a child. It's a 20-year program. That um, gateways, transition, and key connection points where people were coming into neighborhoods or coming into cities was a place that we really wanted to focus. We also knew from the very beginning that we wanted to set a part of our funds aside to do maintenance, to make sure that things we created were um, healthy. And pretty quickly into the program, we realized that um, stewardship, that we needed to make sure our local Hampton Roads artists and Virginia artists were getting these contracts that it really is, if you have the money, easy enough to hire the big names from California and Denver and Seattle who have this kind of experience. But that if we were really going to have a rich program, we needed to make sure that our artists were working. Not just in Norfolk, but we hope our artists are going to go to Seattle and work. So. so this was one of the first projects. This is the Elizabeth River in the waterfront. And I don't know if you can tell. Let me see if I can do my pointer. Right there's. A little wall right here. There are four, four points of it. We actually, was, this was the first project, not the first one we commissioned, but the first we completed and dedicated. Um, and an artist, Stephen Farley from Tucson, came and um, I, I find most artists come from outside the area and they remind us that we're a city on the water. That we, I look out the window, at, at my office window at this every day, but, and because I'm from the West, I'm continually amazed. But I do know people, you know, we forget that water is everywhere. You have to cross water to go to the grocery store in Norfolk. I mean, it's just everywhere. Sometimes it's everywhere too much. But <laughs> <laughs> um, So he went to the sergeant room and learned the history of our waterfront. He took those historic photographs and then through a proprietary technique, um, put them on really commercial ceramic tiles, baked them on, and created the history of our waterfront. So a really great first project. Everybody kind of understood it. Um, so I was talking to somebody in the beginning of that we're a historic city. So it was a way, in a contemporary way, to really honor the history that is so rich in Norfolk and Virginia 
totally. So, This is another downtown project. We're building a new library. And um, this building is actually owned by a private developer. And we're, we have public dollars. So we released an RFP that said um, the artist had to, the artwork had to be movable, that you had to be able to remove it because we actually created a license agreement with the owner of the building and we've licensed the facade of his building to put our public. So they're printed aluminum panels and they represent all of the buildings that have held the downtown Norfolk Library. And then um, you'll see the books are illustrated as birds and they're migrating. And this is really wonderful. You spend a few minutes with it and you understand when you re recognize that the books are birds that are going from library to library to library. Very, very clever, very high energy. So those are our first downtown projects. So in Richmond, anything that's created by hand carries an energetic vibration which can be high, very high depending on the subject and the activity involved in creating it. Um, Elizabeth this morning was talking about the joy that you get from creating art and music. Um, art's a perfect way to raise the vibration in, in any area, and murals should engage the observer, um, creating a visual dialogue. Uh, this is a result of the same mural project, had the goal of creating Richmond as a destination for murals in the United States, and the loftier goal is becoming a catalyst for change by targeting walls in areas of disrepair, virtually raising the energy. Um, it's part of the same project, but if you think about this and the, the intention of the WPA, very, very different intentions from the art. So remember the ballerina clown? Um, what does this do for you? It's all about context and multiple energies interacting. Generally, art has a higher vibration because of the personal creation, but the subject matter must also be taken into consideration. Do you like this? Does it cheer you up when, and raise your spirits when you see it, or is it creepy and does it bring you down? Um, the energy of the, of the observer becomes part of the energy of the art project. So if, if your energy is lessened when you see this, that becomes part of the overall energy of the project itself. In feng shui, we know that everything's alive everyth and everything changes. Um, it, it's really important, especially with murals, to understand that the impact of aging. We know that public art and murals in particular can, can carry very high energy. But as the painting deteriorates, so does the level of positive chi. And in some cases, even, it can even get to a point where the overall energy becomes destructive. And just to talk a little bit about murals, because I know there's a real revitalization, again, of murals across the country and in Virginia, maybe partly because of Richmond or uh, the, uh, the... And it also is a way... Most of our artists are trained in kind of a classical studio tradition, so there are lots of artists working with paint. That taking a jump in scale is a kind of natural step. So lots of programs start with murals. So I'm here with the cautionary tale about murals. Um, it, and the best thing I can say about them is begin with the end in mind. This is a picture that I took when I first got here we, because we love this in Norfolk. It's part of our history. I learned that it had just, a building had just been torn down that had been protecting it for the last 60 or 70 years. This is a picture I took for this presentation. So in the last six or eight years, this is, that's what's happened to the paint on this mural. So even, in, you know, paints are better now. They're more durable in the sun, but um, begin with the end in mind. So if you're painting murals on your buildings, think about this. And I hope my next, I think there's, you have one some more, more before I'm in yeah. another cautionary tale. So this is less of a mural and more of an example of art for art's sake. This painting in Roanoke by Dorothy Gillespie, an artist of some reputation, was created in 1979. Over the years, naturally, it has faded. Um, now, the city worked with the artist to create a, a new color palette, but unfortunately, the owner of the building is not interested in having it restored. So it simply continues to deteriorate, pulling the energy down. So, as Karen had said, it's so important to have an exit plan. So maybe, well, I don't know, are there any other Wyland murals in Virginia? Does anybody know? Maybe you know this artist, Wyland. He um, decided as a fundraiser to save the whales, he was going to paint 100 whale murals around the country. So you'll go to cities like Minneapolis where they, believe it or not, whales are not natural to Minneapolis. <laughs> you will see a whale mural. And when he painted this in Norfolk, 
they tell stories of people watching every night before they, as they drove out of downtown and seeing his progress and watching him paint up on scaffolding or bringing their lawn chairs out. But it's really a well-loved mural. And he's a pretty sophisticated artist. We have number 47. I think he actually has painted more than 100. He has a website if you want to go see where they all are. But they're all similar. So when, actually, when I first came to Norfolk, we inventoried everything that was out there and tried to define what we thought was in our purview and how we were going to take care of it. But that's another talk. Um, but what we said about this mural was that it was really deteriorating and that the owner probably needed to get with Wyland and work on repainting it. But we also said, if you love this mural, you would take down the trees, that you really can't see the main subject matter. And the trees are even bigger now. And no kidding, you would have thought I said, kill the puppy. Because, <laughs> there, I mean, nobody, nobody was interested in taking down the trees. But there still is conversation about every couple of years, who's going to repaint it. And I'll show you that it, the back side of it heads to the Elizabeth River, to the waterfront. And huge chunks of the mural are falling off. That, um, and the Public Art Commission, we want to spend our money making new creative things. We don't. It, it's not what we want to spend our money to restore. And we can't just paint over it. There would be an outcry from our community because it is so well loved. So it really is a problematic piece. And here is a tale. <laughs> um, you, you should ask your artist to sign a, re, a waiver of their Visual Artist Rights Act. This is um, Kenneth Twitchell was, I don't know how well known he was, he was an artist like you and me, of maybe some reputation in, Cal in LA. And he painted these large, he was known for these really large portraits. So this is Ed Rocher, the pop artist. There's maybe you, from your art history class you remember him, or the Virginia Museum has a great Ed Rocher piece here. Um, and painted this mural, and you see this. And if you even Google this, you will see a thousand different versions of the graffiti on it. So somebody all these years has been taking care of it, cleaning the graffiti off and redoing it. Um, the, had a new owner of the building who wanted to paint over it. The, the mural was done after 1991, when the Visual Arts Right, right Act came into effect. And how they did not know this, all you really have to do is, te is notify the artist that you're going to paint over it, or the building is coming down, and you have to give them a certified letter in 90 days. They can come get their artwork, or, but you've notified it. You've done your due diligence. That didn't happen, and Kenneth Twitchell filed a suit to, uh, against the U.S. government and 12 other defendants and won $1.1 million in 2004. So my attorneys in my office knew this story, and it makes my contract. We ask artists actually to sign the, the copyright over to us at the end of every project. We try to give them back those rights in their contract, but it would keep the city from ever. So if you're doing murals in your community, have the artist sign a waiver. Or um, as I'm a painter, I mean, I love that aesthetic of paint on bricks or on the wall. We, when we do them in Norfolk, we um, paint them on board and install them so that the board can be removed. Not, maybe not the perfect solution, but, and I have commissioners who think otherwise, that we ought to take, you know, just let the artist know this is up 10 years and then we're painting over it. So then neighborhoods and communities, that was the other area besides downtown that we thought we would develop some projects. So this was actually the first contract we released was with Madeline Weiner, storyteller. And since you're here, I'm going to remind, tell you what, this was one of our first commissions. We paid $52,000 for it. It was a $52,000 commission. And um, she created these storytellers actually from um, meeting with the community and the task force. This represents a man who grew up in the neighborhood and told the told the tales of the neighborhood. The, we, the budget didn't allow for the plaza. We were just going to put you know, pebbles or crush or find or something around it, but Public Works came forth with the, with the pavement. So it was a, you know, one of our first that Public Works liked us. <laughs> What's particularly interesting here is the medium. We tend to think of stone as cold, and yet it's filled with potential. The carving shifts the energy and exposes the potential, making the figures warm and inviting. You can almost feel the emotion between the figures. The children certainly can and are drawn to it, and as they are, they add their own energy. 
And then another Madeline Weiner, about the same time she was working in Roanoke with Susan. I, there's Susan. So this is um, a project by the same artist. These are such great pieces. Compare the energy of these approachable sculptures to statues that you can only interact with visually. This really brings the energy of community in. Um, another community project that we did recently was Norfolk built a skateboard park. And so we hired Chris Fennell. These projects are $76,000. So I'm going to try to tell you the amount of money that we released it for. And the first thing Chris did was put up a notice at the skate park and in the, where skateboards are sold that said, I'll pay you $10 for your reclaimed skateboard decks. So another talk, but I will tell you it is, we went in with our eyes open, but it is a maintenance problem. <laughs> But anyway, so he created three of these benches with reclaimed skateboard decks from the kids. Then he, we also, he created 600 aluminum fabricated skateboard decks and we roped off a place in the park one beautiful April Saturday. He brought about 200 cans of spray paint and we spray painted all day with grandmothers and little kids and moms and dads and skaters and teenagers and artists and it really you could hardly take the get the spare paint out of people's hands like they always the next one was always going to be better so participation is huge in public art and the fact that so many people were involved in this and were painted it it just really makes a difference um the, painting the boards added to the energy of the piece um, and, and the energy of every person who was involved in painting becomes an energy that attracts other people to this. This is one of my favorite projects, the Tucson Portrait Project. Um, this was in 2009. Um, it's the ultimate expression of community, and it was all done online. They asked the, the people of Tucson to submit a photograph and to sign a waiver, and then they made um, tiles, laminated tiles, and did this wonderful piece of art which really speaks to the community. And it's all online, so if you want to look for somebody in particular, you can go in and search and it will tell you exactly where their picture is. So this was part of the idea of stewarding our local artist. We, um, after we, like I said, we were getting applications from across the country, we were building successful projects, but we designed a summer program in Virginia, the procurement law says um, you have to put it out to low bidder. So if, low, if you're buying pencils and the low bid is from China, you can't buy them from your neighbor. You have to. And the same is really true for art. So we couldn't ever put an RFP out that said only Hampton Roads artists apply or only Virginia artists apply. Um, the same would be true for you unless your procurement office works differently. But that's the state law. So we designed this program where artists were working with kids and we hired them as city employees so they didn't have to do, deal with insurance liability or engineers or because they were a city employee. And um, they created, did an art project over the course of six weeks with high school kids and everybody was paid. Our human services office paid the kids, the, or I'm not supposed to call them kids, but they, you know. And we paid the artists, we paid them a living wage this is our sixth year. We've been doing it six years, and we do three projects every summer. It's a love-hate relationship that I have because it's so fast and furious. But the first year, Cassandra Akers proposed this project that she would paint a fortune on every parking space in the parking garage. So the idea that as you get a parking space, you get a fortune for that day. Another, this is another project, another year. Laura Grant was, maybe you know this artist, I don't know, pretty hot little career in Virginia and a real go for it kind of artist that and the program starts and you have supplies and you have six kids you got to put to work for eight weeks so the first day Laura had 27 geese cut out the second day she was painting rainbows on all their bottoms and stuff and I didn't have approval yet from my parking director that we could put this up in the parking garage so I took the idea to her and somehow I sort of had this intuition that there might be some obstacles and the parking director said to me Oh, that's our best garage, which I later learned is because it's the garage that's made out of brick. It's a brick garage. And um, geese, we hate geese. She said, we hate geese in Norfolk. They mess up our waterways and they poop on our lawns and they don't migrate. And what do geese have to do with transportation? So I went back to Laura and said, Laura, you, you know, you've got to put your education to work and con we've got to convince the parking director that geese have something to do. She wrote a brilliant paragraph 
about how geese migrate and humans migrate through the parking garages, and we got the project accepted. And I think it is one of my favorites. Because it, it has this feel of kind of a shooting gallery as you go in, and then they're all through the floors up that you see geese flying as you go up there. This is another project, John Riddell. He's worked with us a couple of summers, as a matter of fact. Um, it's kinetic. And the parking garage then started coming to us. We did all the downtown parking garages thinking, well, it's not too precious of a space. If, we, if our artists don't have this experience, do something, you know, we're okay, or we can paint over it, or we can... Um, we're now working in precious spaces, and our problems are getting bigger, I have to say. But um, the panels that were between these, the, they were kind of when things had blown out, and the parking director said, maybe you could have an artist that would fill them. And, of course, with our little $20,000 program, we weren't going to solve all their problems. But, John, these are photographs of his three kids' eyes and they're um, painted aluminum, and they're, they, they, they hang on a grid system, so they sort of flap in the sun. So beyond co the commission-sanctioned art is community-initiated art. This is from the RVA Street Festival last September. Five and a half acres of walls and buildings, the former Greater Richmond Transit Depot. Um, national as well as local artists came to illustrate the creative power of street art. And it's a community attempt to bring people together and an excellent way to raise the energy through activity and the impact of everyone's energy and intentions. Another important program that we have is called Arts in the Alley. And this is um, an ongoing project and the intention is transform the alleys and derelict buildings, but even more to raise the energy by bringing businesses and residents together to care for the neighborhood. This helps to reverse the broken windows theory. Are you guys familiar with that? The idea in a neighborhood, if there's a vacant house and a window gets broken and it's not repaired, then another house will have a window broken. It's energy. It's like the idea of this energy, and it keeps trans transforming into other buildings. So this, if you look at, the, at what this building looked like before at the top, it really makes a huge difference. So then remember, downtown, communities and neighborhoods, and also gateways and key transition points. So just some really great examples. I, I think cities all the time are thinking what that transition point was. And the St. Louis Arch was built as a transition to the west on the other side of the Mississippi River. So we talked about the critical um, entrances in feng shui as the place where the chi enters, making the entrance a key factor in your success. Um, gateways set the, the stage for change and raise the level of excitement as people arrive. Another really key gateway you may, you probably all in your head said the bean. It's really called Cloud Gate by Amish Kapoor. And I, I, the thing I sort of most love about this is trying to imagine the committee of people who said, oh yeah, let's build minimal art for $26, 000, $26 million. I just, it's hard to get a committee to think this, it, I, you know, anyway, it's a, it's a fantasy of mine. What, <laughs> what was the conversation in that room? But it's been so successful. If you go to Chicago's, the, their government homepage, you will see the bean. And last year, the same group of people commissioned a $135,000 light show over the course of a couple of months on the bean, where um, a temporary project, yeah, pretty fabulous. So yeah, we built a light rail, I mentioned earlier, in Norfolk, and we, there was no 1% money. It was primarily funded through the federal government, so we didn't have any kind of set aside. But the commission said, this is important. This is where people are coming into our city. It's going to be ever increasingly important. And um, plus, every city in the country that's building a light rail is hiring artists to work on it. So we convinced the bus company, HRT, that if they had the stations designed, if they would give us the glass, they could build them, and then we would hire their contractor, take the glass out, we would have the artist alter it, and we would hire their contractor and put it back in. And they agreed. So we, they, we did 13 projects. They were just $10,000. So this was another way that we knew um, not too many artists would be able to afford to travel. And we were taking away a lot of the obstacles that artists don't understand of installation and contractor's license and liability insurance if you're working up on a construction site. This is a project that the Governor's School for the Arts applied. That's our high school for the arts. So the high school kids went into the fourth grade class at Ingleside um, Elementary 
Ingleside is a neighborhood right across the street from this. It's, the light rail station is absolutely in a neighborhood, and they were most objected to building a light rail. The interstate's right behind it, so it's all, you know, we used the Norfolk Southern rail line is where we built our light rail. But the Civic League president's house was right across the street, so they were very objected to this light rail. So purposely, we engaged the community building this. And I don't know if you can see, it's a, a kid swinging, and his face is made up of, or his body is made up of the fourth grade portraits that are in the neighborhood. What's really wonderful about this is that the neighborhood didn't want it. And so by adding the art and really increasing the energy, this was a way to offset the negative energy that was being created by certain people in the, in the neighborhood. So it's a great way to use art to raise the energy. So they're all really site specific. Maybe kind of one thing different than um, maybe the murals of Richmond is the, this artist was hired and it's in the Freemason area and her design is based on the architectural glass of the classic homes. We, hired, we had 13 contracts, I don't know if I said this, but nine of them were local artists. So we, were, we touted that and the press was pleased. It's paint. I have to say, I thought all of the artists were going to etch glass. I had even researched etcher, glass etchers to help them. Every artist, which is the joy of working with artists and also sometimes, you know, the agony, had some different idea of what they were. So we silk screened. This is a special kind of paint that she ordered from California and bonded. And it's another one of those kind of ideas that we wanted to take the risk with that artist. And we were kind of saying, well, it's only $10,000, really. It's you know, in terms of a bronze sculpture or something, it's not an expensive project. But anyway, Chris and I were out there last summer touching up the paint. Uh, and it, to, it opened in 2011. So every artist did something different. It, really fabulous examples. One artist taught himself to, to um, sandblast himself, of which he says he'll never do again. <laughs> but, Another transportation project, I thought I'd show you some of these fabulous things. Airports have some of the most amazing public art. So if you ever have a layaway, a layover someplace, walk around the airport. Because airports are so expensive to build, they're 1%. They have big amounts of money. If I remember right, this is a six, I'm not even going to say because I'm not sure. Um, and they're discs that ha are motorized, so they actually rotate. And she painted these kind of op art images on aluminum panels. So what this does is actually direct the chi, direct people, so the spinning of this lets you know which direction you're supposed to be going. Oops. Oh, Kevin, there we go again. that was Sorry. my turn. <laughs> <laughs> Another really beautiful um, airport project. This is a Korean American, and it, I, I think the title's really beautiful, Going Away, Coming Home, maybe sometimes talks about that feeling and, and maybe adding some meaning to our airports in a different way. What's great here is the, the fact that there's so much movement created in this very static glass. Um, it, it really tells you how you can create art to create movement even though this something is completely still. The Dallas airport, this is one where I had one of those long layovers and I'd seen this slide and even shown this slide but kind of walked around a corner and said, oh, that Christopher Janney piece. Um, it, as you walk through the labyrinth, you'll see those kind of chrome things on the floor, uh, maybe bronze. As you run through them, it triggers sound and chimes at you as you. So sound is very important in feng shui. If you think of the wind chimes that people use, it's not only the movement, it's also the sound, even the water fountains. It's the sound as much as it is the water. Another airport project. We just hired Gordon Huther to do a project at Ward's Corner for us. This is in Miami-Dade Airport. It's um, made with diachromatic glass that is prismatic, that as you walk, it changes color with the way the light shines. Another really lovely uh, airport project. It represent, you know, refers back to Alice in Wonderland and that transformative journey. And the rabbit is going down a hole that's in a bronze suitcase. Animals are chi enhancers. Anything that moves, anything that stimulates our senses. Um, it's symbolic, speed, agility, excitement of jumping headfirst into, into the unknown. And it, this is all about transition and transformation. And what's really interesting is the choice of color. In feng shui, red is considered fire. And fire is all about transforming because it changes anything that it touches. So this is a really wonderful piece from a feng shui perspective. 
Another really great animal project. This is another one that brands Denver. If you go to Denver's website, you will see the big blue bear. Really cute name, I see what you mean. Lawrence Argent, the same artist who just did the rabbit, um, and started out John Riddell, the eyes. He's a professor who taught a class in public art at DU and a sculptor, and now has a pretty fabulous public art career. Um, and this is all about perspective. It's friendly, approachable, non-confrontational, curious, and it stimulates all of these feelings in us, all of these emotions in us at energetic levels. I really sort of love that it works both interior and exterior. So if you're inside the convention hall, you still can experience this big blue blare looking at you, and if you are just driving by, you still. This is also in Denver. These artists created at the um, animal shelter, uh, I don't, I probably have a note of how tall it is, this huge dog, and he is covered in dog tags, stainless steel dog tags, with an LED light system that changes colors at night. You can see it in the interstate from, as, on the interstate from Denver, so even if all you were doing is driving through, you will not miss the spot. Okay, so the public art, so they set the strat strategic, strategic plan and said, okay, here's where we're going to build artwork, remember, downtown, neighborhoods, connection points. And then every year, with what money, with what 1% is accumulated, we do a work plan of projects where they really sit down. Sometimes community neighborhoods come to us, sometimes the mayor, sometimes we just know that a new <coughs> live school is being built and we want to be sure and be part of that. And then, so they set aside a work plan of projects every, every year. Then um, we form a committee. And every committee is made up of the stakeholders. We wouldn't want our city council appointed commission going into the neighborhood of Berkeley and telling them what kind of art they should have. Or going into the skateboard park and telling them what kind of, so we form these committees of stakeholders. And it's usually a group of people where about half of them have some experience in the art, and about half of them are just community representatives who love their community or are vocal citizens. Or So I lead them through this process, and this is specific to me, but I sort of learned early in my career that often people who don't know the arts or have training in the arts are intimidated. And they're often, that giving them the language to talk about art, they they usually can come forward and say what they want. That, um, so I just created all of these things that I think are the function of art art. And I actually give them a worksheet with little checks. And I tell the committee to tell me three things. There are three most important things that they hope when this art is built that it will do for their community. And they always really know. And sometimes they're really brilliant. I don't know if I've changed this form, but they'll say things like, we want it to stitch our community together. We want it to, that they come up with even, even other ideas. I think I also believed that most people just wanted art to decorate. And I will tell you, of all of the committees I have run, almost unanimously, one of the top choices is to add meaning and value. That sometimes the very most surprising group of people, it, when it comes out, I'm always delighted that they say, we hope this artwork adds meaning to us. So anyway. That, and then the other part of the worksheet is I ask them how they want the art to feel. Part of it is keeping them from saying, gosh, you know, we'd like a bronze statue of our founding father in front of. Or keep them from saying, if we could paint a mural that represents the historic and geographic traditions of our region. That trying to get them to think maybe a little bit more how artists think that rather than subject matter or what it looks like, how do they want it to feel? And so I give them a list of adjectives. And you know, this is in no way meant to be all the adjectives, just to start talking about how you know, colorful or bold or meaning or handmade or m movement, all of the things they would, might talk about. And, and the movement is what's so important, the movement and emotion, because all of that is energy. So what we're really asking them is to put it in terms of energy. And it really is one of um, the, my favorite parts of my job, is sitting with a group of people talking about how much they love their community, and the history of it, and rich little details that you would never know unless you were talking to the woman who grew up there. And maybe couldn't go to the theater because she was black, or whatever the story is, is really fun. So we, that's, we write what's in the, in the world of government. It's called an RFP 
or sometimes an RFQ, request for proposal, request for qualification. In the artist world, we call it a prospectus or a call to artist. That's what we write that we then put out there. That's what this pre-work is done with the committee, getting them to tell me what, that, what we should be looking for. So I thought it would be really interesting to go back and see, hey, so what, what did they say they wanted, and then what did we build after we built it? So this is a project description that we wrote for the zoo in Norfolk. The art should capture the light-hearted, friendly, lively spirit of the zoo. The selected work will hold layers of richness and meaning to be discovered over time. Artwork should be enjoyed by children as well as adults. And this is what we built. All things within all things. It's a life-size African elephant that is fabricated of aluminum butterflies. And if you look a little closer, on his nose is a gold leaf butterfly that is an elephant head. And we feel in Norfolk like we really hit. That I often go to committee meetings and public art's new. Lots of our community doesn't know that we're building art, that their tax money is going for art. But I'll say, have you seen the elephant at the zoo? Or they'll say to me, we want an elephant. We want our elephant. So it was um, a good project. So remember, everything is alive and everything is connected. Um, this is all about the energy of connection. A butterfly can go anywhere, certainly places where an elephant um, would be fairly limited. So this combines strength and movement and a lightness that's seldom a, a, associated with an elephant. So I want to talk about, a little bit about how art heals. Um, I was in Gettysburg a couple years ago and found this piece of table linen in, a, um, in the museum there. And as I looked closer, what I found out was that this was actually a piece of hospital tent that was made into this table linen. And it, it's, it, it's so important because what they did without probably realizing it is they started to transmute the energy of the horror associated with the Civil War into something that was very everyday. So this is all about transmuting energy, transferring energy into something less caustic, less toxic. Um, we saw Sunspot, remember the big the big dog. This is inside Sunspot, inside the, um, the animal shelter. So when someone comes to the shelter with a new, they want to get a new pet, they can buy a tag and have it suspended on one of the hundred chains. They can also buy a tag for their pet that they've lost that they want to memorialize and ha have that hung on the chains as well. So this is all about healing. It's a great opportunity um, so Spot's Collar is a communal gesture of animal stewardship on, on, and on a practical level, it provides additional donor income as they sell the tags. And he forgot to tell you that dogs hold the energy of eternal loyalty or unconditional, unconditional loyalty. loyalty, so those of you with dogs. Another project that was really designed to heal was um, the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Joan Mitchell was an abstract expressionist painter and has a foundation. She decided after Katrina, her foundation, that they would create, they would give 20 grants of $20,000 and build 20 public art projects in New Orleans. And this is one of them that is, um, was made of reclaimed wood out of the houses that were destroyed in Katrina. So the first step to healing is acknowledgement. And some people would say, why do I want a reminder of this horrific event? But acknowledging it is the first way that you start healing it. Um, it becomes not only a monument and a reminder of what happened, but also a symbol of rebuilding, which is really so important. And it has great healing energy. This is another one of the Joan Mitchell projects. So a $20,000 project. It's um, stainless steel probably in water. Now, whether this will maintenance is always kind of begin with the end in mind, whether this is, will really hold up stainless steel sitting in a pond of water. But pretty beautiful, a poem, the water is hungry, the water wants, it says. So there are 20 projects in New Orleans, New Orleans by that foundation. This is a project that was built in Norfolk before I got here, but the public, it was done through kind of all the practices that we do um, with a contract and an individual artist. So the public art program adopted it as a heritage pr project. And what, why we defined it that way is it was things that we said we would maintain with our money. And this was created by Maggie Smith and Jim Cutler out of Seattle. It was built by a private donor who came to the city and said, um, I um, would like to create a memorial 
think it was $100,000, which has cost way more because they built the entire pier. But Maggie and Jim created letters that soldiers had written home. There are 22 of them, one for each conflict that the U.S. has been in since the Revolutionary War. They're actual letters that they researched. And um, as you go along and read the letters, you'll see a date at the top that the soldier wrote it to his mom or his girlfriend or his family member. Read the letter, and then at the bottom you see the day he deceased, which is often within days or uh, within a month of the day the soldier wrote the letter. They're all very much a longing for home, but um, in talking to Maggie, she said they picked letters they wanted each one to evoke a different emotion. And this is great from a feng shui perspective. It's surrounded by, by water, and then you have the wind represented by the windswept letters. So this is really a wonderful monument. Another water project, it seems like you sit with committees and there's always somebody there who wants a fountain. Often public art programs don't like fountains because I don't have anybody on maintenance that's going to go out there every week and clean the pump and put chemicals in the water and all the things you have to do to your backyard swimming pool you have to do to a fountain. So I really love this project at Penn State. When it's dry, it's simply a map of the area and you can sit on the stones and understand your geography. When it rains, the water that that's, comes off the roof flows down the river and into the project. So it's a really, I think, amazing fountain project. Feng Shui obviously loves water. <laughs> moving water is moving chi energy and will activate and enliven in the area where it's found. Water can be a metaphorical symbol for peace, tranquility, and calm. It's associated with vitality, abundance, contemplation, fluidity, and movement. Water is also an extremely important symbol for financial wealth. Another, I think, pretty um, amazingly creative water project in Providence. It um, recognizes the tide, and they simply silver leafed. It's probably not silver leaf, or it would tarnish, right? It's probably silver paint that marks the tide line. And you know, with rising tides, it may even tell us another story as time goes on. And what's wonderful here is the combining of energies. You have the energy of permanence that's created by the rocks, but you also have the energy of, um, of change, of the context of change with expansion and contraction. Really a wonderful piece. Another water project. This is um, San Jose for a while had a 2% program. And in the Silicon Valley, the kinds of things they were building. So this is a $2.6 million fountain. It actually is based on the geography and the artisan um, streams that run under, underground. It's computerized, so it reads the weather and the activity, and the amount of water and the temperature uh, react to its environment by computer read. And then it has these fog veins on the top, but if it's too hot, it reads that and, sp and spews out this mist that cools you. Another really beautiful water project, I hope you can see from our slides, Ned Kahn. He um, created this at the museum in Los Angeles. And there's a mist along the top of the arc, and you see a sidewalk where as you walk through the walking path. So it not only does it cool you, but he's figured out a way to put the mist so that the sun shines on it and creates rainbows, so that you're walking through rainbows, using a you know, natural environment to make something spectacular. This was a broader project we did when I was in Albuquerque, and it was, that one, again, that committee, and it was the judges, because this was the new Metro Courthouse, and the judges were on the committee, and they wanted a fountain. And I will tell you, this is a desert. Making a fountain in Albuquerque is such a political no-no. But we hired Evelyn Rosenberg, who came up with this idea that water is pumped across the beam at the top of it, and about every 15 or 20 minutes, it pumps to one side and tips the scale of justice and spews water out and it uses about a gallon of water a day. This is a great solution in a space like Albuquerque where you really don't want to use water, but you want to have the energy of water. This is in Tucson, and what they've done is create the energy of water without any water at all. Um, it's really a wonderful piece, and we talked about um, how important it is you can have movement with something that's not moving at all. So when you look down into this feature, this is what you see, so you can actually feel it moving. And the important thing about water is, water is financial resources, so you never want water flowing away from you. You always want water coming toward you, or at least flowing in all directions. Um, 
Often public art programs start as a solution to that our public works department says, hey, we need bike racks. Um, and wouldn't it be great if an artist designed our bike rack? And it, so functional art sometimes is a way in in your city government. These are um, sewer covers in Seattle. And they also did um, maps so that if you're ever a tourist in Seattle, you can look down and you can see a map that will direct you to Pike Market. So you don't have to get out your smartphone. Some more fun, the bike racks. Um, I mean, raise your hand if somebody has said bike rack. Let's do art bike racks in your community. Um, I know that these projects, and I think there are a set of three bike racks and three tree grates were forty thousand dollars. A bus stop. I just think it's a really beautiful bus stop and a really great solution. Pretty. Um, it's um, perforated stainless steel. So just um, perfect, and then some ceramic tiles on the columns. Feng Shui loves bus stops. The idea of the energy of people getting off, getting on, and all the exchanges going place, going, taking place is really, really important from an energetic perspective. Another functional piece, uh, mostly the sound walls. I know Richmond has them. There aren't too many in Norfolk, but they're all over the place in the West uh, with big interstates that you have to travel. So this artist, this is on the way to the Miami airport, such a simple solution. The wall runs north and south. So when the sun comes up in the east, it shines a light through these sheets of circles of glass and looks like they're actually lit and electrified. And then when it sets on the other side of it, Martha Schwartz, a New York landscape architect. So this is a crosswalk in Roanoke. Um, we really love this. It's a collaborative effort between the Arts Commission and the Roanoke Symphony and Traffic and Engineering. But it's a great way to, to bring art to a different place where you wouldn't expect to see it. Very high energy and, and a lot of fun. Now art is often used to raise the awareness in, in a, as advertising and to let you know that you've arrived at your destination. This too is actually art associated with the business in the building, Waller and Company Jewelers. It creates energy about trans, tra tradition, um, amplifying the founding date, the history, and giving you a sense of trust. And what's really important about the mural is the front of this building is not very inviting um, from a feng shui perspective. We would want to have something more inviting. So the mural really helps in getting customers and energy into that building. This is also in Richmond. This is a, a great example of pain enhancements to a private building. And you have the sense of the old um, energy, the old paint that was there, some new paint, and it feels like it's um, designed to actually deteriorate, and the deterioration of this actually brings beauty to it over time. Um, you can imagine coming home to this and how different it would be if it was just red brick. Pavement art. Uh, we also convinced our bus company to let us do, to leave little one-inch pads, and we created three different medallions. This is at our, our baseball park is called Harbor Park. It's on the Elizabeth River and the, our light rail is called the Tide and um, the baseball team is called the Tides. And so Abby Silver created the, this medallion that's baseball bats and baseballs and handmade ceramic that looks like a harbor wheel. And then another great floor piece by a Cuban artist in, at the Miami, um, new, new their new performing arts center. At that Performing Arts Center, they also hired um, this artist who worked with indigenous people and the symbols of the native people of Florida and put in the pavements and in the plaza outside the Performing Arts Center. Now, this is a little bit disturbing to me. Um, what feng shui does not like for you to do is put things on the ground if it's something important, like a corporate logo. You, ne you never go into a building in China that would have their corporate logo on the, in the ground where people could walk across it, or a floor mat with a logo where you would wipe your feet. Um, my guess is that some of these symbols are probably sacred and should be um, up, not necessarily on the ground. It's just something to think about. Um, in Roanoke, at the city market, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but at each of the four entrances, they have these incredible mosaics in terracotta. Um, just really, really wonderful art, really raises the energy of, of the place. This is in Virginia Beach, it, it, as opposed to having just plain sidewalks, they've done these wonderful things with bricks. In Curitiba, Brazil, they actually um, 
in the early 70s took up a downtown, decided to make a downtown mall, pulled up all the pavement, and did these incredible designs um, out of the petite pave, the black and white stone that looks very much like marble. And um, it is still the largest um, city mall in the world and very, very successful. And I believe a lot of it has to do with all of the energy that's created by all of this art on the ground. Another floor piece, this is at the water treatment plant. And the artist designed all of the ter terrazzo to represent the water that was flowing in into the plant and through the plant. And there are pieces in the terrazzo that are um, aggregate and things that she found in the streams. Again, this is the, the idea of, of incredible amount of movement created in something that doesn't move at all. Um, the reason this is so, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges. This was through the Petroglyph National, National Park, a new founded national park that was um, created to save the petroglyphs of the Native American in New Mexico. So it's a huge basalt field that is actually, that runs the course of Albuquerque that new development happened on the other side and it was just, roads had to happen through it. So the mayor actually came to us and said, let's hire artists. Do we know these roads are gonna be controversial through sacred land, blah, blah, blah. Let's, um, let's get artists to help us mitigate some of that problem. So we did two design teams and what was so fun as an administrator is we hired the artists at the very same time the engineers were hired. So the artists actually um, help create the flow of the, curve of the, land, of the road. And so petroglyphs, if you're not too familiar with them, they're, they have a lot of sacredness about them. So recreating a petroglyph as a modern person, even if you were native, is not thought to be a healthy thing. So Jim and Sonia took the images. This is a sandhill crane, which you might see a petroglyph of a sandhill frame, and photographically put it on this wall that they designed along the curve of the road. So as you drive by, it's like a flip book, you know, that you your eye puts together the crane. It also, um, Native people believe that petroglyphs reveal themselves to people that they um, choose, that not everybody can see them. So Jim and Sonia loved that myth or that story, and they created these light boxes. Jim and Sonia actually picked the color of the basalt, that gray color is the color of the volcanic rock that comes down, and it's now the sound walls that go around the wall and created these light boxes. So in the day, you just see these decorative prints, but at night, then it lights up and reveals the snake petroglyph to you. We talked about GSA projects. This is the one in Norfolk, which you, if you go to Norfolk, only if you are on the second floor of any building will you see this amazing piece by Athena Taka, really important female land artist. Um, in 1979, created. she was a dancer. She was talking about how rhythm becomes born. And so you see it. But this is what you really see. Um, I think it's a good example of uh, the artist and the GSA came into Norfolk. They had no idea that, that we were trying to build a major pedestrian downtown. This is in a really important corner and it really acts as a barricade. In fact, one of the first things the mayor ever said to me is how can we get rid of that? We can't. The GSA really, only in the case of Richard Serra, has ever decommissioned it. <laughs> <laughs> so this represents a lost opportunity. The energy is compromised, and the intention of the art was completely lost because of the site. So site becomes a very, very important element of, of your art. This is another one that we did, and it was a project that when the new bus station was built, the agreement, whatever the agreement they made with the city, they told HRT, that's our bus company, that they had to ha include public art. So they actually gave us the money and we ran our process. They all, it was, so it's a long road, 18th Street. You most likely would never drive down there unless you were a bus going home for the night. But they, our urban planner designed a clock tower. He loves clock towers. And so there was intended to be a clock tower. When we sat down with the committee, Bus drivers and bus people hate clocks, which, who knew? So we created this project, Pete Beeman, pretty brilliant artist, and it's um, kinetic, solar powered, and it fabricates the opening and closing of doors. And the day Pete finished it and we gave him his last check, we both said, oh, wish we could move it to the front. <laughs> So uh, this is another example where the energy is compromised because the purpose is not immediately or intuitively known. If you have to explain it, 
then you've missed the point of it. So the intended energetic connection is completely lost. Seattle Sculpture Park. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great space, but there's nobody there. There's nobody using it. And you have all of this, this negative, uh, destructive chi created by the traffic and the trains and everything. And then there's so much confusion about how all the angles come together. This just is not a place where you would feel comfortable or particularly safe. Another space. Sort of one of those spaces that you would say, ooh, but really transformed. Yeah, makes it very comfortable. Celebrate. Yeah, so rituals bring depth of meaning to our experiences, make our commitments visible, and embody our values and beliefs. Rituals and ceremonies can be used to celebrate a positive shift in energy that's about to occur. So every major project should be accompanied by a celebration to acknowledge, solidify, and enhance the positive energy. And the positive energy is further enhanced when the stakeholders are involved and all of their energy is involved as well. So we've run the gamut from arts history through the selection process, maintenance, siting, and finally celebrating. And we've looked at the influence of feng shui along the way so that we understand how energy is created not only by the art, but the energy is subtly affected by those who observe there's clearly an energetic exchange. So what is the next step? How can we raise the bar so that the energy of observation escalates to the energy of participation, magnifying the role and, con and contribution of the observer? And this is where um, interactive art is really sort of the epitome and now more and more. This is the Phoenix um, Canal system. You read this poem or sing into the mic and it activates a light that makes fish Oh, swim. Um, another FaceTime, it's called. It actually is sort of like a visual Facebook page. Throughout the day, you can go and be recorded, and then at night, your recording and your face is shown on the building of this condo. The great thing about this quote from Henry Matisse is he's saying he's not painting the table, but the emotion or the energy of the table. And then this is an interactive piece that we dedicated last May in Norfolk that we're pretty proud of. It's um, our feature light rail piece, so you see when the light rail comes, it flashes gold and silver. Each one of those flowers has a, a light and a sound and a um, sensor in it. So it encourages you to dance around and figure out where you trigger the sensor and the flower reacts to you. So just imagine all the energy that's going on, all the energy exchange with the people who are loving the piece of art and the art itself. We. We actually changed the Virginia law after this piece. But we had to hire the contractor. And so after it was installed, it was about $304,000. Our original contract with the artist was two hundred and fifty. dollars Electro land out of L.A. And what about maintenance? Well, they actually have an amazing track record. So far, we haven't had to do anything to it. We paid for some upgraded stainless steel. So it's stainless steel, the quality of the beam in Chicago. We, when they were installing it, we trained our computer expert on the computers. And that base, you actually can pull out and work on the computers. And there's already talk of reprogramming it so it does something different. OK, any other questions? You have to take these things through planning commissions and zoning ordinances. In, um, in Norfolk, we, public art doesn't have to go through planning and zoning unless we're in a historic neighborhood or downtown. So only the downtown projects have to go through design review. And if you've ever been through a design review in Norfolk, <laughs> or if you haven't been through design review anywhere, yeah, it's, yeah. But, yeah. Have, have there been any partnerships between um, the city or your organization and museums in Norfolk? Well, actually the museum director and now the museum assistant director sits on the public art commission. We haven't, although we're talking about doing some temporary projects on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. And um, they actually came to us with the idea for a partnership. And the commission felt like they maybe didn't want a partnership so much as they wanted our money. And we can't just give our money. It's taxpayer money, so we have to go through an open and fair process. So, and I'm assuming anybody in Virginia would have to do the same thing. So was the impression that, that the museum professionals wouldn't necessarily cotton to the process that you already have? Well, they already had a piece they wanted to buy. They already knew where they wanted to put it. The, an artist, more the way a museum acquires artwork. Mm -hmm. that it's pretty different the way we acquire artwork. Not that we couldn't purchase something that was already in existence, 
we would just have to put a call out and say, hey, show us what you have for sale for $200,000. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty limited. Not a lot of artists have $200,000 work hanging around. So, yeah. Um, and how do you get the word out? Well, I actually, I think the very first time I came to Art Sort Conference, that was my big question. How do you tell Virginia artists? And, I, and there really wasn't a way. I have a database of Virginia artists, so if anybody wants to reach them, send me your call and I'll um, put it out to my database that I think really there's 700 artists that live in Virginia, including things like um, the adjunct, or not the adjunct, the um, a professor at VCU and the major colleges where sculpture students are coming, or sculpture professors, and also Americans for the Arts. Put it on their listserv and it goes viral. So if, if anybody need, which I felt like I really needed when I first moved to Virginia, that, you know, I, and some of you all have them too, but anyway, I've acquired that, so if you're putting the word out. And if you have artists who want to put their name in our, in our listserv, in our database, send them to us. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank well, you so much for coming. So we'll shorten it this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have to come back and get the first book. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank it's you. Really good fun.